In lecture seven, we are going to be looking at special senses. Uh, we are going to be looking at different types of sensory receptors uh, that are located in uh, various um, sensory organs. Uh, we will be um, having an emphasis on the eyes as well as the ears, uh, but we will look at some of the other senses uh, briefly um, as well. So uh, we know that uh, there has to be some kind of sensory receptor um, to kind of start the um, a path of information flow within the uh, nervous system where we, we first discussed this in lecture uh, five I believe right we have these sensory uh, receptor that are dedicated for detecting uh, changes in a particular type of uh, uh, stimulus um, so for example you might have one that detects uh, light in the eye you might have one that detects pressure uh, pressure in the in the skin and once that change has been detected um, the sensory receptor will use neuro a transmitter to communicate with a sensory neuron uh, and then the rest of the path we learned previously right um, the sensory neurons forming the afferent path taking the information to the central nervous system and then you will have motor neurons that would be coming out from there uh, and connecting to the effector so uh, this lectures focus will be on the uh, sensory receptor uh, particularly you know uh, 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 what kind of sensory receptors are there and where are they located um, within the body. So there are uh, five different types of sensory receptors uh, that we have in the body. Uh, the first one is what we call mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are triggered by uh, changes in pressure uh, or body movement. Right? So you have a lot of uh, uh, sensory receptors uh, in the skin. Um, you have some uh, that are closer to the surface and those would be sensitive to uh, light touch. Okay? So like um, uh, an ant crawling on your skin, for example, would, would be picked up by some of these surface mechano uh, receptors. And then you have some that are in the deeper layers of the skin uh, and those would be um, picking up um, a more uh, forceful uh, push on the uh, on the skin so like you know someone poking you with a with a pen for example um, those would require deeper mechanical receptors uh, but mechanical receptors are not just found um, in the skin you will also find them uh, in the inner ear uh, and in the in inner ear the uh, mechanical receptors are responsible for detecting uh, body movements so more on that later when we talk about the ear Next, we have thermal receptors. Uh, as the name uh, implies, thermal receptors are stimulated by changes in external or internal temperature. Right. So, if your skin feels cold or hot uh, when you, uh, uh, you know, uh, come in contact with ice or with a with a heat pad, um, that's the uh, thermal receptors in the skin uh, registering those changes. Uh, but you also have thermal receptors in internal organs. Um, if you ever had an IV. Um, given to you uh, it's quite possible that you feel the uh, uh, the coldness of the IV fluid going through your veins um, or a simpler example is uh, if you drink a glass of uh, uh, ice cold water you can actually feel it uh, going down your esophagus and uh, ultimately in your stomach uh, and those temperature changes are also registered by thermal receptors but this time located on internal structures internal organs Next, we have pain receptors, or also known as nociceptors. There are two types of nociceptors in the body. Um, the somatic nociceptors are the ones that are found in skin and skeletal muscle. So basically, when you have a pain that originates from a, a part of the body that you have voluntary control over, um, those kind of pain are going to be registered by the somatic nociceptors. Um, so the response to mechanical damage, like if you have a cut uh, or if you scrape uh, your knees or something, that would be a mechanical type of damage. Uh, thermal would be like burning a finger, uh, electrical, it's like electrical shock from a wire, for example. Uh, chemical would be if you touch um, some acid, right? So all these type of uh, damage uh, are going to uh, result in pain that will be registered by the somatic nociceptors. The other type of uh, receptors we have uh, uh, is called the visceral nociceptors. So these are um, pain receptors that will register pain that arise from uh, places that we don't have voluntary control over. And for the most part, these are basically internal organs. Um, so they will react to things like excessive stretching of an internal organ. Um, that could happen when you eat too much and your stomach is too full. Uh, or that could happen if you have, say, 
uh, uh, a gallstone, right? Uh, stones that grows in a gallbladder, and one of them is stuck in the uh, in the duct, uh, and it causes the duct to uh, be extended, to be stretched, right? Um, and that is, of course, very painful, um, and that would be registered by the visceral nociceptors. Uh, chemical uh, are released by damaged tissue in some cases um, that could result in pain. Uh, we have um, oxygen deprivation in some cases um, that could also result in uh, pain in uh, in the organs. Now uh, there is a phenomenon called referred pain. In referred pain, uh, the pain that you feel in one part of the body is actually caused by pain or injury in another part of the body. Okay, so uh, uh, an example of that is uh, if someone is having a heart attack, for example, um, that is caused by uh, a reduction of uh, blood flow to the heart muscle, uh, and that could um, result in pain that would be picked up by the uh, visceral nociceptors. However, you are not going to feel the pain in the heart uh, necessarily. You're going to feel that the pain originates from your left shoulder instead. So um, that is an example of referred pain. Okay, you feel the pain is coming from your shoulder, but it is actually not the source. Right, the source is is the heart. So why is that the case? Well, it turns out that um, the somatic uh, pain nociceptors uh, um, they would uh, connect with uh, the afferent pathway, uh, and, and that afferent pathway is going to go up to the brain uh, through the ascending tracts, right, uh, in the spinal cord. Um, that uh, sometimes will merge with another uh, 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 afferent pathway that connects with the visceral nociceptors. So let's say, you, you know, your heart is here, and then the pathway is going to go up to the brain, okay? And then this would be your shoulder, and I don't know how to draw shoulder, so I'm just gonna put like the word shoulder. So the shoulder is going to have the somatic uh, 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 pathway, uh, the pain pathway. So it's gonna go into the spinal cord and then it will merge with the other path that's coming from the heart and together they will go up to the brain. And when it does get up to the brain, your brain will interpret the pain uh, coming from a source that you're more familiar with, right? So growing up, we are very familiar with uh, somatic type of pain, right? You know, if you fall down, we scrape your knees and whatnot. So the brain interprets the pain as if it's coming from the shoulder, even though it is coming from the heart. And there are many, many other examples uh, um, that are related to this referred pain. Uh, a common one experienced by 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 guys, for example, would be if you play uh, soccer and then the ball hits you uh, uh, in the groin area, then then you would feel the pain. Uh, in the abdomen instead, uh, instead of the of the groin, uh, that is another example of uh, referred pain. Uh, in some very rare uh, cases, uh, there is a genetic uh, um, disorder that caused a person to not be able to feel pain. Um, that might sound like a good thing, but actually, is not. Pain is a is a way that your body tells you that something is wrong, and you need to stop and see, you know, what is wrong, and try to fix it. Um, so, you know, if if you don't, if you if you're not able to feel pain, uh, like this little girl, uh, her par parents describe her as, you know, she would be running around, and then she would fall down, uh, and then she would be bleeding from the fall, uh, but she would just get right up and, and start running again. So, a lot of times, she end up having injuries um, that are quite severe, but she would not be aware of uh, something is wrong uh, and she would just you know continue uh, on about her day um, and and that result in uh, you know not taking care of the wounds quick enough uh, and you know um, resulting in even more injuries um, in some cases um, so something like this is called congenital uh, that means you're born with it congenital insensitivity um, to pain or CIP uh, it's so rare that um, only about 20 cases have been reported in the scientific literature. Um, so just to quick recap, we talk about mechanoreceptors that are going to be stimulated by um, changes in pressure uh, or movements. We talk about um, uh, uh, nociceptors and thermoreceptors. Uh, um, two more we're going to look at. Uh, one is the chemoreceptors. Um, we learned about chemoreceptors uh, in lecture four uh, before, right? when we talk about how the um, respiratory centers uh, is able to detect uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, we talk about how the carotid body uh, in the aorta is able to detect oxygen content 
in the uh, in the blood so all these are examples of chemoreceptors they detect a particular chemical concentration uh, you know in the body um, for example um, but um, you will also have chemoreceptors in uh, in taste buds uh, uh, that's where you will um, detect things like uh, glucose for sweetness um, uh, uh, sodium for salt for example uh, you will also have some in the in the nose for smell uh, and all these uh, chemoreceptors are uh, dedicated for detecting a particular uh, chemical. Uh, last but not least, we have the photoreceptors, uh, and they are located in the eye. Uh, and you have uh, receptors to detect um, three main colors, uh, red, green, and blue. And uh, uh, by combining these receptors, you can see all the other colors. More on that later when we talk about the eye. Next, we're going to look at uh, taste and smell. The sensory receptors for uh, a sense of taste are located in, uh, in taste buds, and a lot of these taste buds are embedded in the epithelium, uh, mostly in the tongue, uh, and they are found along the walls of something called, uh, called the papillae. Okay. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like on the next picture. Uh, but there are also isolated taste buds uh, found in the hard palate, uh, the pharynx, as well as uh, even the, um, the epiglottis. Um, so sometimes, you know, you, you, you eat something that tastes kind of gross and, and you say all that the, 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 the taste kind of lingers at the back of your throat, right? So it's, it's not just your imagination, right? Um, because there are actually taste buds in the, in the pharynx, the back of your throat. Um, so it's quite possible that, um, you know, unpleasant taste uh, sometimes do lingers uh, at the back of your throat. So here uh, is your typical tongue, uh, and the uh, surface of the tongue is actually quite uh, bumpy. Um, if you were to zoom in to um, to the uh, to the tongue, uh, you will see these uh, uh, round structures that are called the uh, papilla. Right? And uh, uh, if you look at the sides of the papilla, that's where you're going to find um, the taste bud. This is perhaps not the best diagram uh, to illustrate this, but you know, if you look at the tongue from the side, this is the tongue from the side, and you're gonna you're gonna slice it with uh, with a, a sagittal section, uh, and you zoom in on it with a microscope, then you will see that there are these uh, uh, round structures. Okay. So, so that's taking a mid sagittal section of the tongue, so cutting it like this, okay, and then looking at it from the side, okay, then you're going to see that it looks like this. Each of these round knobs, they are called the papilla, papilla, and located uh, on the side of the papilla, right, these things that I'm drawing right now, those would be your taste bud, okay. So this here is the top of the tongue, and then down here, that would be the bottom, bottom of your tongue, okay, and then you have a lot of these uh, papillae, plural, you just add an E, and on the side of the wall of the papilla, uh, you will find the taste buds. Okay, so these taste buds are going to be connected to uh, uh, sensory neurons um, when they uh, detect a particular uh, chemical, um, then they will uh, send a signal to these uh, sensory neurons. So um, we have taste buds for uh, uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and something called umami. Okay? Umami uh, means uh, uh, yummy, delicious in, in Japanese. Uh, and that's kind of like the uh, taste we experience when we eat something savory. Okay? So if you eat uh, meat, right, there's that savory uh, taste to it. If you eat like uh, fast food, junk food, right, uh, uh, there is that savory uh, taste to it. Um, because the umami receptor is stimulated by, uh, by MSG. Okay, um, so a lot of people think MSG are like additives, right? Wh which they are. You know, you, you could add extra MSG, right, uh, to uh, enhance the flavor of food. But um, the MSG actually stands for monosodium glutamate, and glutamic acid is one of the naturally occurring uh, amino acids that are found in, uh, in in proteins. So when you eat meat, right, without adding artificial MSG, the glutamic acid will actually stimulate um, the taste buds for umami, uh, and you will still uh, have that uh, savory um, sensation. Okay, so uh, to uh, have a sensation of sweetness, um, you would need to have glucose. Uh, for sourness is H+. You might learn in your chemistry class that uh, the more H+, you have, the more acidic something is. Uh, so the H+, will also give us the uh, sensation of sourness. And Na+, for uh, a sensation of saltiness. 
Now, something interesting, uh, according to astronauts, uh, they are not able to uh, uh, taste their food uh, as, as 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 good as they could uh, on on Earth. Okay, so for some reason, up in space, um, probably because of the uh, reduction in gravity, the taste buds they don't work uh, quite as well. So everything kind of tastes bland. Uh, and to solve that problem, uh, astronauts actually uh, uh, bring hot sauce uh, with them uh, to add to their food. So there's going to be some, at least some sensation to what they're eating. It's worth mentioning that uh, spiciness is not considered as a taste. Uh, um, it's a completely different mechanism um, for uh, detecting spiciness um, than for detecting our uh, regular taste like uh, sweetness or, sa or sourness. Um, the pathway to the brain is completely different. Uh, and uh, to detect the uh, active ingredient in, um, in active chemical rather uh, in creating the spicy sen sensation uh, is, is something called uh, capsaicin uh, and the receptor for capsaicin uh, is not uh, an example uh, of, a, of a taste bud so for that reason um, spicy is not is not a taste so all these uh, uh, taste information will travel to uh, the gustatory region uh, of the brain and that is located partly in the parietal lobe uh, and partly in uh, the insula loop. So uh, if you pry it open the, um, uh, along the lateral fissure, uh, if you pry open the uh, frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, you will see the insula lobe, uh, and in there uh, is your gustatory region, uh, which is responsible for processing uh, taste. Okay? And part of that will overlap with the um, uh, uh, parietal lobe right here. Next, we have smell. Okay, so our sense of smell is dependent on uh, something called the olfactory cells, and they are located within the roof of your nasal cavity. Um, these olfactory cells are uh, modified neurons, and uh, each cell ends in a tuft of about five olfactory cilia. Uh, and in these cilia, you will uh, find uh, receptor proteins uh, for odor molecules. So we don't have a special receptor for each of the uh, smell out there. Uh, there is just not enough space uh, in the uh, in the nose to pack all those receptors uh, in there. Uh, think about how many different smell we we have in the, in the whole world, right? Uh, we we don't have a receptors uh, dedicated um, uh, dedicated for rose, uh, or we don't have one that's dedicated to uh, say laundry or something, right? Um, it, it, it's not one receptor for every smell out there. So how exactly do you register a uh, smell then? Well, it turns out uh, um, the odor molecule will activate a group of receptors proteins, uh, which then allows you to register uh, uh, the odor as, a, as a, some kind of a odor signature. Um, so what I mean um, by this is, is, is this. Uh, if, you, if you look at this diagram, um, let's say you have rows here. Uh, the rows would give off uh, a blue and green odor molecule. And when it uh, is detected by these uh, cells in the olfactory bulb, uh, um, the brain will interpret the combination of blue and green uh, odor molecule as, uh, as rows. Okay, so let's do another let's do another example. So let's say we have three receptors, right? We have receptors A, B, and C. Uh, how many different smell can we register with just three receptors? So let's say for smell number one, okay, in order for us to smell number one, uh, let's say that would be the smell of uh, 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 tulip or something, okay? Then um, you can you can pick that up with receptor A. Uh, and then the other two would not be functioning. Let's say we have another smell, smell of uh, fresh laundry. Um, then we would turn on B, but not the other two. Let's say we have another smell. Uh, this would be smell of uh, lavender or something. Um, then you can uh, turn on C, but not the other one. So there are three smells, right? But you can actually uh, detect more smells. Let's say we have we have another smell, smell number four, smell of chocolate or something. That could be. Uh, a combination of A and B, right? Just like the rows, right? But not C. Um, so uh, another another smell, number five, right? Um, you can have uh, A and C, but not B. Another smell, you can have uh, B and C, but not A. And then number seven, you can have all three, right? So, um, and of course, you know, number eight would be like no smell, and then you turn everything off, okay? So with just three receptors, you can detect up to uh, uh, eight different types of smell, right? So um, this quickly 
uh, uh, adds up. If you have 10 receptors, 10 receptors, right, then each receptor can be turned on or turned off. So there are two possible configurations for each receptors. So you can have two times, two times, two, dot, 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 which is two to the exponent 10. Uh, and that could code up to 1024 uh, different scent. Okay, so every time you have some kind of odor, um, that will flip on a bunch of um, uh, receptors and, 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 and not others, and that would create like a sensory uh, uh, odor signature for that specific smell, right? So uh, again, let's say we have 10, 10 uh, receptors and then you have uh, a, a lemon or something. So lemon is gonna turn on a bunch of them. So it'll be like on, off, on, 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 off, off, on, on, off, on, right? So this would be like a barcode that gets sent to the uh, temporal lobe. That's where uh, smell is being uh, uh, register and then they was the, the brain would interpret this configuration of receptor as the smell of lemon okay so you might have another smell and this time it will be like you know off on 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 off 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 on on off off on off when I say on and off um, I mean like turning on a particular receptors and turning off the other one and that would create an other barcode right so each odor is going to have a unique uh, uh, odor uh, signature which the brain will then interpret it as a particular uh, scent. Some people have what's called uh, specific anosmia, uh, and that's the inability to smell certain things. And of all the things that you cannot smell, uh, perhaps the best one to not smell uh, is the smell of, uh, of skunk. Uh, uh, and uh, there are people in this world who cannot smell the uh, um, uh, strong scent uh, from, the, uh, from the skunk spray. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a sulfur um, containing compound uh, that they cannot register. Uh, and, of course, um, that is a relatively good thing to have. Next, we are going to uh, look at vision, uh, and let's start by labeling the eyeball. Okay, so uh, go to your workbook, and we'll label this diagram um, together. Uh, I'll briefly talk about what the parts uh, do uh, as we label them, uh, but we'll go into more details when we go into the, um, the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, your eyeball has three layers to it. Uh, and the outermost layer, the layer that uh, makes up the white of the eye, uh, is called the sclera. So I'm trying to uh, color the sclera here for you. Uh, it's going to be the white of the eye, uh, and it provides attachment sites for eye muscle um, so that the eyeballs can move. So this is called the sclera. The sclera uh, is quite tough, uh, quite fibrous, uh, and it protects the eyeball to a certain extent. Now, the sclera is going to uh, change into a transparent, uh, 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 convex-shaped uh, um, part here, and that is called the cornea. The cornea is the transparent, uh, convex um, structure that is at the front of the eye and uh, convex means is bulging out right uh, and that allows you to uh, collect light from a from a wide angle right uh, it's kind of like the security mirror in a, in a convenience store it collects light from a wide angle uh, and that gives us uh, a wide angle vision okay so the cornea is part of the sclera but it has to be transparent so light can go uh, into it now, be beneath the sclera is going to be the second layer, uh, and this layer is going to be uh, uh, containing a lot of blood vessels. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to, lay to, to color here because it's so thin, um, so hopefully you'll be able to do a better job uh, than me, but uh, there it is. Um, this is the uh, choroid. Okay? Um, you might remember this word, it sounds a little bit familiar, right? The choroid plexus. So choroid just means it's uh, highly vascularized. It has a lot of blood vessels. Uh, and the uh, label that's pointing at the choroid is, is D here, choroid. Okay, so this has a lot of blood vessels. Uh, it supplies the eyeball with, uh, with nutrients. Uh, and the choroid at the front is going to become the color part of the eye. And so the color part of the eye, uh, you know, people have uh, blue eyes, green eyes, uh, uh, brown eyes, so on and so forth. The color part of the eye uh, is uh, called the iris. 
So here I'm gonna call it the iris for you. Okay, and the iris is uh, part of the choroid is actually uh, uh, um, smooth muscles. Um, so the uh, iris can contract or relax and that would uh, change the size of the pupil. Okay, so there is the pupil. Uh, there's no label to it. So maybe maybe we can add one. Uh, that is the pupil. Of course, the pupil uh, allows, um, controls how much light goes into the eye. Uh, if it's dark, you want the pupil to be uh, bigger. So the iris will relax. Uh, and, and make the pupil bigger. Uh, and if it's really bright, then the pupil is going to be smaller uh, and the iris will have to contract in order to create a smaller pupil. The size of the pupil is uh, regulated uh, completely uh, with your um, autonomic nervous system, your ANS, uh, where the sympathetic system will cause uh, uh, vasodilation uh, and the parasympathetic system uh, will cause uh, vaso, uh, will cause your pupil to um, to con constrict to, to become smaller. Um, the uh, innermost layer, the innermost layer of the eyeball, uh, is going to be the retina, and um, that is where you will find the photoreceptors. So let me try to color the innermost layer for you first. There it is. Okay, that's the innermost layer of the eyeball and uh, we call that the retina okay retina so I'm just gonna put it right here for now the retina contains uh, uh, contains photoreceptors okay and uh, oops sorry and there are two types of photoreceptors um, there are the cones which detects color uh, and there are the rods which is important for night vision so we have three types of cones uh, for detecting red, uh, blue, and green. Okay, uh, more on that later. So three layers of the eye. Uh, from the most superficial, uh, we have sclera. Beneath that is choroid, and beneath that is the retina. Uh, located at the back of the retina is a special point, special location uh, called the fovea. And the fovea uh, is where you will have the highest density of cone cells, uh, and that will allow you to produce the sharpest image. Okay, produce the sharpest image of what whatever you're looking at. Okay, sharpest image. Um, at the back of the uh, eyeball, that's where the optic nerve is going to exit. So the optic nerve will eventually uh, connect to the um, uh, occipital lobe and along the way there are many other structures and we will look into that. Uh, but where the optic nerve exits, um, you cannot have photoreceptors because the nerve is in the way uh, and that creates a blind spot. Okay, a blind spot. So another name for blind spot is optic, optic disc. Right, so each eyeball has its own blind spot uh, where you won't be able to see uh, certain things. Uh, 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 but the two eyes, are if the, both of the eyes are open, uh, then they kind of complement each other. Uh, so there are no true blind spots um, if both of your eyes are, are, are open and, and functional. Uh, what else do we have here? Okay, um, the, the lens is located right here. The lens of the eye. Uh, the purpose of a lens is to uh, focus light rays uh, so that it will uh, project onto the uh, the retina um, in order for you to see uh, things. So um, the lens is number. Uh, let me see here. It's kind of hard. Okay, there we go. L. This is lens, uh, and is a converging lens. Okay. Uh, let me write down for you converging lens. That means it causes uh, light rates to, to come together. Right? So if I have uh, 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 light rates coming in here, and then we have another light rates coming in here, the converging lens will cause the beams to come together like that. Okay? And it might get projected onto, say, the fovea. Um, so another example of a converging lens in, uh, in real life would be a magnifying glass. Okay? It causes uh, light rates to focus on a single point. Um, in front of the lens, okay, be between the cornea and the lens, uh, there are going to be uh, uh, some liquid in there, uh, and that liquid uh, is going to be called the aqueous humor. Aqueous humor. Okay. 
that's J right here, aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor uh, contains nutrients uh, that would nourish the cornea as well as the lens. We cannot have blood vessels going through the cornea or the lens, otherwise it would uh, uh, show up in our field of views, right? Um, and, and we don't want that. So uh, without its own um, blood vessel supplies, uh, it needs to rely on the aqueous humor to get the uh, nutrients. Uh, and when the aqueous humor is um, is used up, it will uh, go to the back of the eye, and it will fill up this entire uh, posterior chamber, posterior chamber. Okay, and uh, in this diagram, you can only see half of it being uh, filled up. So this liquid here uh, is basically the used up uh, aqueous humor, um, and we call that the virtuous humor virtuous humor so it's uh, basically a waste product that uh, that is uh, waiting to be to be drained away virtuous humor uh, and while it's waiting to be uh, uh, drained away it actually helps reinforce the shape of the eyeball so down here um, O is pointing at the anterior chamber which is filled with the aqueous humor, uh, whereas the back here, P, is pointing at the posterior chamber, which is filled with the um, virtuous humor. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Okay. At A here, A here is pointing at a draining uh, a point. Uh, we call this the scleral, scleral venous, Sinus. You might remember a venous sinus is a, a location where you drain excess fluid. Uh, this one is located uh, in, within the uh, sclera, uh, and its function is to drain the uh, virtuous humor. You don't want the virtuous humor to build up too much in the eye. That could increase your intraocular uh, uh, pressure, the eye pressure, uh, and with high eye pressure, it would damage the uh, optic nerve, uh, causing you to have uh, things like uh, glaucoma. Um, Next, we have the lens. Uh, again, the lens um, will have to change shape depending on what you're looking at. Um, so for example, if you're focusing on something that's far away, then your lens needs to be um, uh, thinner. And if you are looking at something that is uh, nearby, then your lens needs to be uh, thicker. Uh, and to change the thickness of the lens, um, you are going to have to uh, control it with uh, some muscle and the muscle that controls the thickness of the lens uh, is shown here. Uh, those are called the uh, ciliary muscle. Ciliary muscle. Okay. So that would be uh, B here. Ciliary muscle. And when the ciliary muscle contract or relax, it will change the tightness of these ligaments that are connected to uh, to the um, to the uh, to the lens, uh, and these ligaments they are called suspensory suspensory ligament. Okay, uh, we'll look at exactly how that uh, uh, happens uh, later on. Uh, don't worry about eye; uh, we will not be uh, talking about that uh, right now.